You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 64 of the Common Descent Podcast. I love a square number. Yeah, 64 was a good station. That, too. I don't get that joke. In 64. Oh, today on the podcast, we are discussing the much-anticipated topic of paleo art. Yeah, a lot of people have been waiting for this one. Paleo art is a subset of scientific illustration in which artists strive to recreate ancient organisms, ancient ecosystems. It's where all the cool dinosaur artwork comes from, sculpture, museum murals, movies and video games, arguably, depending on which ones we're talking about. (laughs) In this episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about the history of paleo art, what paleo art is, and how it's done. But much like certain other episodes, Will and I are not experts in paleo art. No, we are not. We are not artists. Well, no. No, we're like word artists. (laughs) So today we are super excited to announce that after the news, we will be joined by special guest Gabriel Lugato. Who is a paleo artist? Yes, we are bringing in an expert. Yes, Gabriel will talk with us. He's phoning in from Miami. will talk with us about paleo art and some of his own work and his own experience with paleo art. And give us an actual experience point of view. And if you like what you heard from him, check out the blog post at the end of the episode for links to his stuff because he's super cool, as yeah. it turns out. Absolutely. He's also a fellow podcaster. He's on the Squamates podcast. Yeah, which is, that that's two different skills that are awesome to have together. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, Gabriel is a herpetologist and a paleo artist. And I mean, what better person for this episode of the Common Descent podcast? It's just, can we ask for any better? This episode topic was also requested a few times. Just a few. By one of our patrons, Belladonna, as well as Charlie and Ed. So thanks, folks. Yeah, thanks. A few announcements before we begin. Speaking of patrons, we have a Patreon, in case you hadn't known. Patreon covers pretty much all that the podcast does. We are recording this before we head off to NAPC, the North American Paleontological Conference. Yep. Which Patreon is helping to support our trip to. It's flying us there. If you are a patron or if you're thinking about becoming a patron, don't forget that we do director's notes for each episode these days. We just finished up, well, we'll yes, as, when this episode comes out, we will have just finished up our Kai June Silver Screen Science series. Indeed. And we've been putting more thoughts for patrons up on the Patreon. And after this episode, we've kind of stopped doing after chat, but after this episode, Gabriel will be on an extra little bonus discussion for basically after chat on the Patreon. Yeah. So bonus goodies for the patrons. Like I said, check out Kaijun from this month. If you haven't already look out for updates on the social media and hopefully some recordings from NAPC. Yes. And since by the time this comes out, we will have already returned from the big NAPC trip. We should officially announce our next big trip. (laughs) We're going back to Atlanta, Will's old stomping grounds. Yeah. For Dragon Con. Uh, We're both going to be there as guest professionals, so we'll be on a slew of panels. Yes, so we'll let you know more about that as we know more about that. Yep. That'll be the what, end of August, beginning of September? Uh, Yes, it's it's, uh, Labor Day weekend right there at the beginning of September. So keep an eye out for all of that. And with those announcements, it is time, before we talk about art, to talk about the news. As with every episode, we like to grab some stuff from the world of news and paleontology, evolution, and related sciences. Will, what news have you brought today? The first bit of news I have is one that's been making some rounds about Arctic hyenas. That's not where hyenas live. No, it isn't anymore. Ooh. This research is by Jack Singh et al. in the Open Quaternary publication and the article we'll be linking to is by rachel gutman in the atlantic 
And this is new research on some material from way up north here in North America that shows there were Arctic hyenas, which actually fills in a little bit of the gap of the mystery of how we got hyenas in North America, because we've known about hyenas in North America for a while. Fossil hyenas. Yes. Going back almost 100 years, they found the first specimens of North American hyenas. So we knew that at some point we had a population here. And the question became, how did they get here? Right, because hyenas are old world. Old world. African is where they are now. Fossils are found in Europe and Asia and Africa. So at some point they made it over to North America. And the species they found, Chasmoporothetes ossifragus. And they proposed that at some point, this species, or a close relative of it, had made its way across that Bering Strait land bridge in between the west coast of North America and Siberia that allowed a lot of organisms to travel from east to west and west to east. Oh, yeah. E Eurasia to North America. The bison and mammoths and us. All sorts of cool things like that. And that makes complete sense, but they didn't have any fossils. Yeah, so they've been basically saying for a long time, we should find hyena fossils yep. up in this Arctic Passage, and here they are. And so these two teeth, only two teeth, so not a lot of material, but readily identified as hyena teeth, were found in the Yukon, which is the territory of Canada right next to Alaska. Yes. So we're talking way up north. Right on the... Pa if you were coming over here from Siberia, you'd have to go through the Yukon. Yes. Now... Fun fact, these are not new fossils. They were discovered in 1974 and 1977, respectively, for hmm. each one, and identified as hyena, but unofficially identified as a different species at the time. Never okay. published, but it was written down at one point in some notes basically saying, I think they're a different species, and there you go. And then they went into collections at the Canadian Museum of Nature and sat there for about 40 years. Yep. Until... In the last few years, they were brought to the attention of Jack Singh, and after a little bit of analysis, was able to tell that they are Chasmoporthetes as well. So here are those hyenas they were looking for. Very cool. Now, they already know from the other specimens, these hyenas were a little bit different than our modern ones, uh, a little bit more longer and evenly proportioned legs, so they're not going to have that sloping back that hyenas are so well known for. Right, right. And a little bit more of a a shallower skull, so not quite the deep set hyena skull. So they probably look a little bit more like wolves. Right, right. And we're probably better at more long distance movement, running and everything. Yeah, this speed genus has been called the running hyenas. Yeah. So hyenas today are tough but they're not chasers they're going to come in bully anything away or take something down very quickly but they're not chasing things across the savanna no that's a very dog thing to do yes that long pursuit but there are two things to note here one we don't have a lot of specimens and this is partially because of the area the area is a heavy glaciation site so glaciers have ground up much of the land yeah and in fact the quotes in the article that i read were from our friend leah yes oh that's right yeah leah was coming yeah there. leah who helped us with episode 34 ancient dna leah lynch was cited as one of the people they interviewed to get another perspective and she mentioned the glaciers the fact that basically they just grind up as they expand and retract over the seasons and just turn everything to just rubble now, you can also get great preservation with permafrost and glaciers of the frozen pelts and fur and skinned animals that we have found. But as for fossils in the rock... Underneath the ice sheets. It's not always great. No. But she also did comment that she was very... That she appreciated this publication because they were conservative. They realized they only have two teeth, so they can't make a really strong identification for sure it's the same species or for sure it's a different species but they recognize from what we have this is what we think and they did not make any as she put it sweeping hypotheses about the situations this suggested they mainly just identified the teeth which fills into a larger narrative about these hyenas 
I, I like stories like this because they're wonderful demonstrations of the predictive nature of our understanding of the world. That's one thing, one version of uh, the definition of science I heard that's always stuck with me is that science should be predictive. Yes. Well, that's and that's part of what a theory is. Exactly. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about evolutionary theory and tectonic theory, and it's easy to forget that the whole, like, history of the Earth that we have laid out is this grand sweeping set of scientific theories working together to create this time scale. And stuff like this is exactly what that helps us to predict. Yeah. Is you're able to say, here's all the evidence we have. If we dig in this place, we should find this animal. Well, it's, it's very similar to the story of finding Tiktaalik. Yep. We have a time frame with which we suspect a specimen at least similar to what we have potentially described should be found. Yeah, if you read uh, Neil Shubin's Your Inner Fish. Yes. He describes the discovery of the famous fishapod, mm -hmm. Tiktaalik. And yeah, he describes, we laid out a map. They knew what age they wanted. Yep, so they knew what rocks they needed. And so they found maps with those rocks. And sure enough, digging in the right age rock gave them a specimen that was very much what they were expecting to find from the transition of fish to tetrapod. It only took them like six years. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, lickety split. This one only took 40, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, and now the question is how many of how many more hyena bones are waiting to be found another in thing, museums somewhere? Oh, yes. Another thing I appreciate about this article is they made the point that this is not unusual in paleontology. Oh, no. In that one of the people who dug at the site said that they were quoted saying that they could sometimes bring back 10,000 specimens after a summer of digging from that single site. And there's no way you can process those. And as they said, you don't always have a hyena specialist on hand. Yes. So, yeah, I, I like these moments of just, oh, yeah, and this old thing it is now a new thing. Speaking of old things and new things, my first bit of news is about microbes and dinosaur bones. Ooh, cool. So this is research by Evan Saita et al. in eLife, and we'll link to a press release on phys.org. As we've discussed previously, there's a whole revolution happening in paleontology these days about discovering ancient molecules. Yeah, proteins and pigments and all sorts of cool stuff that for a very long time we assumed we would never find. One of the exciting branches of this is the discoveries, the, the alleged discoveries, of proteins and s blood cells and 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 blood vessel remnants in dinosaur bones. Yeah. This has been reported on for many many years and it has been the subject of much debate. Yeah, very controversial as to what what exactly is being found. And one of the arguments against it. Now, now there are I've been lots of studies published saying here's why we have identified these organic remains as original protein you know blood vessel deterioration stuff like that but there have always been people saying well maybe it's not yeah and the big argument against it is that it could be living modern day or very recent microbes contamination biofilm so this study attempted to test this by examining dinosaur bone for organic remains in as sterile a condition as they could which is important so they went out, dug up some Centrosaurus bone, that is a ceratopsian, from Dinosaur Provincial Park. This is late Cretaceous. Took it out of the ground and followed a bunch of protocols to ensure they wouldn't get contamination. Because you take it out, you're touching it, it's in the air, bacteria and stuff are going to get in there. Yeah. They took a bunch of precautions. They tested it for evidence of contamination. Did not find any. So it seemed that they had actually gotten bone fresh out of the ground that they could then test mm -hmm. outside the worry of contamination. They tested for evidence of endogenous protein, which means original protein, stuff that was originally there in the bone, particularly collagen, which is a very common protein in bones. It's where we look to get things like ancient DNA and, and radiocarbon and stuff like that and did not find any evidence of it which is not in the favor of the other publications that suggest that they have found that. 
They also found evidence of recent amino acids and DNA, which certainly should not be surviving in dinosaur bone, even if protein is. And sequencing of the genetic material suggested a diversity of microbes. Ah. Which is interesting because they took methods to avoid contamination. Yeah. So they found no evidence of original dinosaur proteins and abundant evidence of microbes hanging out inside the dinosaur bone. This was interesting because as the press release uh, quotes the, the author is saying, a third of these microbe, the, the microbe population that they found are related to a type of microbe that are found in strange places like Etruscan tombs and the skin of sea cucumbers weird yeah so strange microbe communities <laughs> it's it's like extremophiles but just weird well yeah it's extremophiles <laughs> for living in dinosaur bone and i guess you can yeah. cucumber skins weirdophiles but if these aren't contaminants then that that suggests is that while the bones were sitting there in the earth they just became home to microbes yeah that it, it just became a a culture site for that them. they were they got deep underground and made their way in there because they're microbes and they go everywhere. Is it the same reason that mold shows up no matter what you do? Because yep. it's in the air right now. Right, it's right it's all around us. <laughs> it's the it's that episode from Invader Zim. Yeah, it's that. <laughs> the press release also points out that this isn't too surprising. Mm -hmm. Bones are full of phosphorus and iron and nutrients that lots of microbes would love to have. Bones are also porous, so they're soaking up moisture. Yeah. So, yeah, the inside of bone might actually be a delightful place to be a microbe. It's that, that sponginess that makes it so so good to hang in there. Now, this is certainly not a nail in the coffin on the idea of finding dinosaur proteins in dinosaur bone. I'm sure there will be much more studies coming out, going back and forth, looking at different types of data. But this study, at the very least, suggests that we need to be careful. Yes. That there are lots of micro... Even if not every report of dinosaur protein is microbial mm -hmm. confusion, that there are lots of microbes in there, and it's something that needs to be looked out for. For. And I'm fascinated to know what the dynamics of that ecosystem are. Oh, yeah. How cool is that to make a home in dinosaur bones? It's it's bizarre how specialized bacteria can become. Uh, bacteria and fungus are both in that way. Where it's like, this this strain is found only in this kind of spot. Yeah. This one lives only in Centrosaurus bones. Yep. Like, <laughs> they're so weird and, and flexible. And it also is a you know slightly maddening in the fact that it makes it so difficult to know what protein or genetic material you're actually looking at from any yes. sample of anything you know at any point you're gonna have some sort of little microscopic freeloaders <laughs> in your sample so we'll see surely there will be more to come yeah we'll keep our eyes out very cool. All right, so my next bit of news. I, I started with hyenas, and I'm going to end with crocs. This month included World Croc Day. Yes, it did. Happy World Croc Day, everybody. Yeah, to all of you who voted correctly on all those <laughs> lovely polls. It was June 17th. Yes, it was. World Croc Day. <laughs> well, speaking of crocs, let's talk about the croc climate clock, so the article calls it. Say that three times fast. Yeah, no, I'm not going to. Croc climate clock. Croc climate clock, croc climate clock. <laughs> That's a very dangerous tongue twister. <laughs> depending you know, on, depending now that on you which, it. which letter gets omitted. <laughs> so this is a bit of new research into the biodiversity of crocs during the end of the Eocene and beginning of the Oligocene periods. Ah, uh, quite a time. Yes. So there was a high rate of turnover, and some new research is showing that. Crocs were affected in different ways than we had initially expected or proposed due to evidence at the time. So this is research by Stéphane Jouve et al. in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, JVP. And the press release we'll be linking to is by Taylor and Francis in phys.org. First, what is a paleoclimate clock? Well, 
This is basically the idea of using the animals as an indicator for what the climate was like at the time which those fossils are from. Yes. And crocodilians for a long time have been used as a semi-reliable version of this because being ectothermic, cold-blooded, they are climate sensitive. They are limited by the climate as to where they can live. You know, they need certain amounts of heat. Change the temperature, change the crocs. Exactly. So you see them often move with climatic changes or their populations shift in their ranges. This is a great example of this. It's something we've mentioned before. It's what happened at Gray when they were first finding stuff. Yep. The alligator was the first thing that said, nope, you need to raise that temperature. Yep. And that readjusted which dates they were looking at. So things like that. That's a very simple version of it, but that's basically what we're talking about. Well, this new research suggests that it's not necessarily a straightforward. Doesn't mean they can't be useful, but there's more to it. During the Eocene to Oligocene changeover, there was climatic shifts that caused lowering sea levels and cooling temperatures, which often go hand in hand. This is connected to the high levels of extinction that happened during that time. Many animals and plants saw high turnover rates of species, and it was proposed that Crocodilians experience a very similar uh, extinction rate as the other animals. Closer look at specifically the Morocco area where these fossils are from shows that it wasn't uniform for all crocodilians, though. For the marine longerostrine, the long slender snouted crocs, they all had to flee the Europe area down toward northern Africa and follow those warmer temperatures. These included gavialoids and temistamines, which are the true and false scariole of today. Mm -hmm. That Those groups, so members of those groups, some of which even moved to South America. Uh, oh, there fun. are gavioli gavialoids that made their way to South America, which I wasn't fully aware of. So that follows what we expected. Their ranges up north were basically destroyed, and they had to move south to survive. Right. Got too cold, so they moved. If you yes. can't stand the cold, get out of Europe. Which means their range was shrunk. So it was became a band instead of a wide spread out area. And that's what we had you know, expected to find. But then with other members, more alligator-like members, the Diplocynodons, these, which were also in Europe, maintained their range basically throughout the entire transition. Even as it got cold. Even as it got cold. And it's notable that they compare them to alligators because nowadays the Chinese and American alligator are the two most cold tolerant of all the crocodilians. Yeah. So what this shows us is we can't use crocs as a guaranteed way to indicate general things about the climate. Depends on what croc you're looking at. Yeah, you can't just say we have a croc. Must have been warm. Yeah. This is, it's interesting because... On the one hand, this sounds like it's shooting an idea down. Yep, yep. There goes that it tool. sounds like, no, no, no. Get but what it actually says to me is that Crocs offer even better detail than we had thought. Yeah. That depending on what kind of Crocs you have, you can learn a ton about their particular ecosystem at that particular time. So if your Diplocynodon, who if I remember that, press release right was freshwater yes yes they as were. opposed to a lot of the marine species that the, their status now we we know that these animals are reacting differently it's not just temperature which opens us up to explore how different ecosystems are reacting yeah so it can actually give us a more complex image of the paleo climate uh, especially if you have multiple crocodilians to compare across yeah that period so th this is proposing uh, that there may be an even more precise climate croc, crocodilian climate croc, croc climate clock. yeah, <laughs> to use in the future. So not bad, crocs. Yeah, cool stuff. Well, my last bit of news is going to take us down to Australia. I like it there. And to invertebrates. Oh. No, 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 no. Trilobites. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Big trilobites. Nice. This is research by James Holmes et al. in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology. We'll link to an article in Gizmodo by Ryan F. Mandelbaum. Down in Kangaroo Island, South Australia, there is a formation called the Emu Bay Shale. It is a lagerstatten. 
which means exceptional preservation. Yes. Like Burgess Shale, exceptional preservation. Like the Grey Fossil Site, which has been called a Lagerstatten. Yay. This Lagerstatten dates to the early Cambrian. So right around the time of the Cambrian explosion, right during the Cambrian explosion, which we discussed in episode 9, tons of really wonderfully preserved specimens, including lots and lots of trilobites. These are the little sort of pillbug-looking arthropods, super famous from the Paleozoic. But kind of like if you fused a horseshoe crab and a, and a pill bug. Yeah, trilobites. For a very long time, one particular genus of trilobite from this formation, Redlichia, has been identified as the species Redlichia tacuensis, originally identified from China, but researchers have noted that there's a lot of variation within the, the specimens at the site, which they originally have attributed to ontogeny. Oh, okay. Episode 33, they're saying, oh, well, there's a lot of differences in the morphology, the shape of these trilobites, but that looks like it's adult versus young. Yeah, it's them growing up. This study disagrees. <sighs> they examined 482 trilobite specimens from this site belonging to the genus Redlichia because wow. invertebrates. Wow. You can do that when you're studying trilobites. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> and what they found was evidence for two distinct morphs, two distinct shapes and types of trilobites, one of which is significantly larger and thicker, robust, beefy trilobites, and has more leg spines. Oh. And a few other differences in the, in the head morphology and stuff. Bigger, better armed yeah. trilobites. The authors suggest that this is reason enough to split the two morphs into two species. Mm -hmm. So the smaller one remains Redlichia tacuensis, and the new one, the larger morph, has been given a new name, Redlichia rex. Yeah. Because that's what you do. Because, yeah, that's it, it simply is not done. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> Redlichia rex is thus the largest known trilobite species from Australia. Nice. Growing near a whopping 30 centimeters. Wow. So a foot. Which is a big trilobite. That's notable. That's not the biggest trilobite. There were some... Isotelus, I think, was at least twice that size. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. But Redlichia rex is twice the size of any of the other trilobites that are found in the same formation. Nice. So it was a big one. The authors suggest that the formidable legs with the spines on them were potentially for crushing and shredding prey. Okay. Maybe even other trilobites. It would make sense. And indeed, lots of trilobites from this formation are found with injuries on them from predators. Ooh. And apparently the formation has lots of coprolites... <laughs> Episode 30, fossilized poop with trilobite bits in them. Cool. So there were prominent trilobite predators in this fossil site, which may have included this big species of trilobite. I love the morphological analysis because it points out how easy it is to either see trends that aren't there or miss trends that are there without something to come in as a unbiased observer a.k.a. the computer. Yes. <laughs> and I like when it comes out. For, no, actually, it breaks down in a much more simple way than we had first anticipated once measurements were taken in and it was run through the program. And you get cool stuff like this, where now all of a sudden you realize one is a particularly beefy trilobite. And changing of species and splitting of species is something that happens all the time. We've talked about that. Episode 12, 10, 10, 10. Episode 10, Tree mm -hmm. of Life. So this might not stick. Oh, yeah. But even if it doesn't, big potentially predatory trilobites, nonetheless. Well, if we just want to make it more interesting, all we have to do is suggest that it's uh, sexual dimorphism. There you go, yes. <laughs> big predatory females. <laughs> the other thing the authors point out is that this is also in the midst of the Cambrian explosion. Yeah. And the that large predators... Large, well-armed predators may very well have been part of that new arms race. That new competition for acquiring food and defending yourself and surviving. And so looking at species like this can give us a better understanding of how organisms were doing what they did in 
this grand radiation of life. Yeah, how these new food webs that had not existed before were coming into being. Indeed. Cool. Another thing that was notable about some of these articles, that the Arctic hyenas, mm -hmm. and one of the articles I saw about Red Lickia Rex, had artist reconstructions of the fossil organisms. Perhaps by paleo artists? By paleo artists. <sighs> What? A ton of paleo news comes accompanied with artistic renderings, images, paintings, sculptures of the fossil creatures because paleo art is super important. And often overlooked. Inextricable from the science of paleontology. And hey, what do you say we talk about it? I think this is a good plan. After the break, we will be joined by Gabriel Lugato to talk with us about paleo art. Yeah, stick around. Hello, Gabriel. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us. We're very excited to have you with us to talk about paleo art today. Thank you for having me. I mean, it's an honor to be in one of the few podcasts that I listen to. <laughs> Ooh, that's, that's, that's high praise. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> prestige. It's true, I, I listen like to five or four podcasts. And you guys are one of the few ones that I listen to. We made the short list. We did. You hear that, listeners? Now, before we get into our, our discussion proper, please introduce yourself for our listeners. Okay, so my name is Gabriel Ugeto. I'm a paleo artist and scientific illustrator. And I am from, I am from Venezuela, but I live in uh, Miami, Florida. Very cool. And you are also a herpetologist. Yes, I used to work in herpetology. Actually, like I say in my own podcast, Quamates, I used to work in herpetology, but not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well you're uh, uh, any herpetologists past or present are more than welcome on our podcast it's, it's, it's <laughs> grandfathered in once you <laughs> once you've studied you're good do you do you like snakes or crocs better snakes i'm you know our our podcast is called squamates for a reason but but since i work with dinosaurs and uh so i i, I also I, I must say I, i'm i also love archosaurs in general so yeah crocs are also Okay. All right. These are good answers. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have you mention that uh, the podcast again later. But yes, we know Gabriel in part from being one of the hosts of the Squamates podcast, which is a podcast about herpetology. So again, right up our alley and tons of fun. So if you don't know it, listeners, check it out. We'll put a link in the podcast description this time around. But today we are not here to talk about herpetology, a rare yeah, sense for us. Yeah. But about paleo art. So, Gabriel, you are a paleo artist. Please start us off by just explaining what is paleo art. So, paleo art is is this it's a it's like a branch of uh, scientific illustration that is in charge of depicting extinct animals and plants, extinct life forms, mostly animals and plants, and based on scientific evidence, based on the, on the latest, latest scientific hypothesis or data. Um, and in some ways, it's the only way to show general audiences what these extinct life forms look like when they were alive. So that's how we get all of our visuals for, exactly. for those organisms. Exactly. And when I think of paleo art, I usually, and this may be a bias for me, I'm picturing illustration and, and paintings and sometimes sculpture, things like that. I'm immediately thinking of all the books I used to read as a kid. Yeah. Like all of those books I repeatedly checked out at the library. But is there a limit to what is included in paleo art? No. Basically, any, science, any artistic depiction in any artistic uh, art form uh, can be construed as paleo art. I'm not sure if people would call like um, speculative sound recordings of what a <laughs> of what a <laughs> dinosaur or something could have sounded like paleo art, but I guess you could call it that. That was actually exactly where my my brain was going. Is I wonder I wonder if that would fall under the category for anyone. Interesting. Yeah. Well, now we're butting up against the question of what is art, and that is 
way beyond oh, the scope. Well, again, let's, let's tackle that right now. I'm <laughs> sure. you, need, yeah, you need a whole new podcast for that. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, but I, I imagine like animation, for example. Like uh, that, that's uh, that that definitely could be considered paleo art. So I think about movies. Yes, absolutely. Know, like Jurassic Park and and the films that, for you know, scientific inaccuracies notwithstanding, are an art form reconstructing paleo prehistoric ancient creatures. Yeah, and you have um, so many documentaries. I mean, Walking with Dinosaurs was extremely important, and it is one of the uh, uh, of the things that had marked uh, an important point in the history of paleo art. So animations and uh, CG graphics in, in documentaries and movies are important, also, and they're part of paleo art, whether they are accurate or not. But well, and it, it makes sense, because uh, that, that's kind of combining all the, the aspects of, of someone has to do a concept art for it then you have to do a 3d reconstruction model and then you have the sound and then also the movement and the biomechanics so it makes sense that animation would be that that animation would have been so important yes but in some ways it also makes it the most inaccurate because um, oh. you have to you there are so many speculative ideas that have to be thrown into a complete cgi reconstruction that involves not only the way the animal looked, but how it moved, how it sounded, what it, what it was doing. So it becomes like super spe speculative. So, and, and, and let me just say that we have to start from the point that all paleo art is essentially wrong. You know, like we uh, don't, we cannot say that, oh, I am, this is 100% accurate because we don't know what these animals look like. And we have more evidence for some than for others. And we can, say that we have a better idea of what some animals that we have more evidence for look like than for others. But you cannot say that 100% this is what an animal looked like based right. on the evidence that we have. It's always a hypothesis. It's yes. always a hypothesis, yes. I like that as a baseline uh, uh, thought to start with is all paleo art is going to be wrong to some degree. And if yep. accepting that then moving forward is... Key. I, I like that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Most of the time it's wrong to a large degree. <laughs> <laughs> so given the variety of paleo art, before we move on, I want to ask what kind of paleo art do you do? What are your favorite media and what are your favorite artistic subjects? Okay. So I am trained as a 2D traditional illustrator. I trained in traditional media for many, many years, but around 10 years ago, I made the jump to digital. And now I work solely as a 2D digital illustrator. I have been thinking about doing some 3, uh, 3D modeling, but I haven't done it. I haven't gone into that yet, mostly because of lack of time. But it's something I would like to explore at some point. Okay. And do you? Uh, what well, you know? Paleo art again. The classic image is for me dinosaurs. Yeah. That's sort of probably the longest running paleo art subject. More about that in, in a little bit. Do you do dinosaur art? Do you do? Do you get to do a lot of herps? What kind of things do you tend to work in? All of the above. Now, I, I, <laughs> I, I, of course, I do dinosaurs, and they are, you know, one of the most requested commissions that artists usually get, paleo artists usually get. But I, I work on a lot of, you know, uh, reptiles and Mesozoic reptiles and amphibians and uh, um, extinct mammals. Um, I actually have worked on some uh, Mesozoic insects, Ooh. some of which haven't come out yet. <laughs> but, but yeah, basically, um, I'm, I'm an equal opportunity <laughs> offender. <laughs> you do not discriminate. Yes. I don't discriminate. Although I do have a, definitely have a preference for tetrapods. That's definitely where I'm most comfortable and what I like the most. We can sympathize. Yes. Yeah. No. So I will give you a chance to talk more about your personal work later on in the episode, but let's take a step back. What is, so, so there's all this variety in paleo art. What is the goal that unites all paleo art? What, why, are, we, what are you trying to accomplish? Why paleo art? Well, have you guys um, read a new scientific publication that comes out 
and describing a new species of dinosaur, and what is the first thing that you not usually recall or remember about that new species on the press release? It's usually the piece of art that is accompanying that press release that shows what that animal looked like, right? I mean, that's yes. what we, yeah, that's what we, most people, the general audience that, it, that are not paleontologists or herpetologists or something that is focused on other details, the first thing they're going to zoom at are the depiction of what that animal looked like. So that is the, the importance of paleo art because that illustration is what's going to pique the interest to the reader or the viewer. And um, it's what's going to create that sense of imagination that need to know more about that subject that they just it makes the, the it takes it from conceptual to something real that they can they can put an image and identity to exactly normally if you show uh, people a, a lot of bones even when they are uh, mounted as a skeleton uh, you know like a museum skeleton yes that's great and wonderful but it's when you put flesh and muscle and skin to that that people usually truly can grasp how amazing or how weird or how crazy that animal looked like, you know? Yeah. Well, you see this a lot with, you know, even with modern day animals, a skeleton does not equate an animal for most people. Most people looking at a skeleton don't, you know, you, you don't automatically flesh it out. It just looks like bones. It doesn't seem like a real life moving, living creature unless it has all that stuff we're missing in the fossil record usually. Yeah, I mean, most animal skeletons look completely different of what the animal looked like with, you know, when with all these muscles and an integument outside. I mean, um, if you grab a bird and you see the skeleton and you see what the bird looks like with all the feathers and it's completely different. There's no, usually there's no way, well, which is also why you see sometimes in stores all these crazy skeletons of birds. Uh, like in, like on last Halloween, I went to Target and I, I saw the craziest looking plastic skeletons that made it look like birds have like on their wings and stuff or, or bones in their tail because people don't have a good reference of what an animal would look like without, you know, all the external integument. So yeah, they, it, it looks completely different both bones and, and animals with all the flesh and, and skin and everything. I, I particularly love the Halloween skeletons where it's dogs or cats with their ears oh, yeah. on the skull. <laughs> Ear bones. Yeah. <laughs> Picking up. Yeah. I like that, Gabriel, you started that example by saying if you grab a bird, because if you physically, literally grab a bird, yes. you instantly get the sense that the skeleton is not what it looks like on the outside. Yeah. It's like a rabbit or something. Yes. It's all fluff. And then there's this little skeleton inside. Oh, Listen, that. shave your cat and see what happens. <laughs> you see, you see all, all the crazy folds and stuff that cats have. have like, cats have like a ton of crazy folds and, and you know, pataja between their, their, uh, the lens and stuff. And they look completely different just by shaving them, not even taking the skin off. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and I think it's something that's easy for people with a background in these topics to forget. You know, because we yeah. can look at, we can, I can glance at a crocodile skull and immediately fill in the rest of the crocodile because I know which one it goes to. Mm -hmm. And, or we can look at a, you know, rabbit skulls or it was a great example because I would use that at the aquarium and it always threw people off because it does not look like a little fuzzy rabbit face. Nope. It's big open spaces. And it's easy to forget that if you've been in that realm for too long. Yeah, and so I think it's important to remember that other people, they they need, they need that filled in for them with that, some sort of image. that supplemental information. Yes. Yeah, and and the other thing is size. Um, uh, if you guys have seen a skeleton, even a human skeleton, sometimes you see how small it is compared to what a, an animal or a person looked like when it's you know all fleshed out. Um, it's uh, the, the, there's even difference in size. So when people say, oh, this gigantic skeleton of a dinosaur looks so big. Well, imagine it with flesh and, 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 you know, flesh and muscle, it would have looked even larger. Yeah, with the other 10 tons. Yeah, on yeah it. exactly. Their, their legs are not that, are not as skinny as the bone is. There's all meat and muscle around it. Oh, yes. And this, now we're dancing around a, a concept that has always fascinated me to think about, 
is this question of what would paleontology be without art? Like yeah. tr trying to conceive of what paleontology, especially the public perception, but even within the field itself, I can't imagine paleontology would be anywhere near as advanced or interesting if we didn't have paleo artists going back a hundred years fleshing these things out for us to understand. For sure. I mean, it would have it would have changed completely. But I, I would make the case that not only paleontology, I think all sciences benefit from art one way or another, have and keep benefiting from, from art in one way or another. You know, I cannot imagine seeing any paper about herpetology, for example. The description of a new species is always accompanied by a description, of a drawing of the head of the holotype, for example, of a snake. Or where you, you know, have to draw the, all the scales and, you know, that is the diagnosis of that species. That is what's going to show other people, you know, without having to go to the museum to look at that specimen on the microscope. That's what is going to show people what the squamation of the head of that particular spe species looks like. So all sciences, in one way or another, have benefited from art. You know, we just saw it with the, the recent depiction of the black hole that they found. They, they, it was an artist's rendition. That's not what it looked like. That's not what the scientists saw. So it keeps happening. It, it's, art and science are way more intertwined than generally people think. And paleontology is one of the ones that is the most intertwined because there is no way to really grab uh, an idea of what these animals look like without an artist recreating them. One of the things that immediately brings to mind for me the idea of separating art from paleontology is the reference I made earlier about the books I read as a kid is how many paleontologists would never have gotten into their field without having dinosaur toys or books to read and to be able to look at the dinosaurs. You know, that's it's where a lot of people got their start was just a, a fan interest as a child and then a professional interest later on. And it's, I mean, the, the information was fascinating, but the images were what kept my child's attention, you know, my child brain attention back then. Uh, oh, actually, I, a lot of, I, I've noticed that a lot of artists and paleontologists, I mean, a lot of paleo artists and a lot of paleontologists have been inspired by the same books. Um, like uh, I posted a book about uh, that I got when I was a little little kid uh, from Peter Salinger, I think it was. It had I hadn't seen it in years, and then I posted a picture of it that I found online. It's like, oh, this book inspired me so much, and I got so many responses of other paleo artists and paleontologists. that said, oh yeah, I also had it. I remember it, you know. And, and it seems like people that triggered something in people that that's one of the reasons I get they got interested in what they do. You know? And in fact, as you were you're both saying this, I'm remembering the the dinosaur book that introduced me to my favorite dinosaur, yeah. which is Deinonychus. <laughs> and if I can find a picture of this book, I'll I'll post it. But the image in my head is not the words about Deinonychus or even the skeletal images. It's the cover image of this Deinonychus running across this Cretaceous landscape. That was my first. That's what inspired me to get interested in these animals. Absolutely. Is that illustration, which oh, it's so, it didn't have any feathers or anything because this was the 90s. <laughs> but yeah, yeah it's, it's, that's still, that's the image in my head. No, it's, exactly. it's critical stuff. Uh, for me, dinosaur toys were a huge part. If I didn't have dinosaur toys to play with, I don't think my imagination would have been able to cling on to the concept of these ancient creatures nearly as well. Yeah. Yes. And, and we mentioned movies and, yeah. I mean, Jurassic Park inspired an entire generation of paleontologists. <laughs> so, yeah. absolutely. Like, this this is, it's, paleo art is essential for inspiring people to get into the field, for communication between scientists, illustrating, you know, scientific illustration, and also just because I, if there's a an article about a really cool, like, salamander or a little rodent or something or something that I'm not super familiar with. I still want to see the art, even though I, I understand the anatomy. And then especially for the general public. Well, because if you just read a description of something, sometimes it's, it, if it's not an animal you're familiar with, it's, I'm there like, okay, I kind of think I have an idea of what you're talking about, but I'm not a specialist in bird anatomy. So 
I well, don't. and also uh, paleo art serves us to to depict hypothesized behavior too, which is something that is very important. Like you know, you can see what the animal, we, what we think that animal was possibly doing, and how it was possibly behaving, or what we was possibly eating. All those things are very important like messages that you can convey through art. Which in it, yes, the other other way to convey it is through text, and uh, it doesn't have the same grasp. Mm hmm. Right, right. Now, of course, paleo art is not a new thing. This no. has been going on for quite some time. So let's talk about history a little bit. Gabriel, can you tell us a bit about how paleo art got started? I can give you a, a brief summary of, because it's a long, it can be like super long to explain everything. But basically, paleo art started almost when paleontology started. So paleontology more or less started like in the late 1700s and I think the first piece of what we can call paleo art uh, it was done in 1800 like the year 1800 exactly <laughs> um, and, and it was a, a depiction of a pterosaur really odd because it was uh, thought as a mammal and he had fur, which is not that far from what we think now that they look like, but he had also like external genitalia. And the, the, the long finger of the wing was attached at its end to the ankle. So it looked like he had like rounded <laughs> wings. Oh, yes, oh. I, I have seen that. <laughs> yes. All right. So, but, it, but I think that's considered the first piece of actual belly art, you know, but, but, but it wasn't. That that pterosaur depiction was not intended to be seen by the public. It was like a, a, a quick sketch that was exchanged between paleontologists, you know, thinking what this animal looked like. So after that, uh, as the 1800s went on, there were a lot more uh, published works with actual paleo art depiction. That's why we see all those, I don't know if you have if you guys have seen in those old depictions of uh, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs that look like they're all done in like um, ink and they look like they are like throwing like water. How do you call that? The, like, okay. like, yeah, yeah like blowing like, like whales. Yeah. Yes. So those are from that time. Then is when uh, also the with the first dinosaur because at that point we mostly knew about marine reptiles and pterosaurs and stuff, but they were very when the first when they started finding the first uh, dinosaurs bones in Europe, then is when we start seeing actual depictions of dinosaurs, and then we have the dinosaurs of Crystal Palace, which has the famous, very inaccurate depictions of megalodon in like a four like a quadruped quadrupedal animal, and the depiction of iguanodon with the horn. Yes. On the, yep. Yes, that's a famous one. So those are the famous dinosaurs of Crystal Palace in the UK at that time that's we had a you know we we can look at them now and see oh they're terrible this is they, they are so inaccurate but it has a value I think that, that seeing those depictions definitely have an has a has an artistic value and also has a historical value I think it's important to remember our knowledge at that point and and, and I think those uh those sculptures from the Crystal Palace, for example, are amazing. They are definitely a sight to see. Absolutely. No, it's I, I I agree. It is definitely important to remember, you know, how far our understandings come and how it's changed. Because it's going back to your uh, original point of pa paleo art is going to be wrong. Yeah, it was true back then. It's still true today. You know, yeah. so it's, it's kind of nice to look back every now and then and go, oh, don't don't assume you're necessarily any better. Like, <laughs> you know, 200 years from now, people are going to look back and go, what? Oh, yeah. Plus, yeah. the cool part is that we have found several extinct Mesozoic reptiles. Like, I'm thinking about, like, Alocotosaurus, for example. They are not too different from those. I mean, they look kind of similar to what um, they were doing with the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, so. <laughs> Vindication, yes, many many yeah. years. Ago. Well, and the paleo art record also gives us a very aesthetic and visual history of mistakes. Oh yeah, which is 
which is historically fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say that afterwards, like in the late 1800s, like when when there was there was this intensification of paleontology discoveries because they started finding all these dinosaur bones in the western side of the United States. That's where you see a huge intensification in, 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 in paleo art as well from all these new discoveries. And that's where this probably the most important paleo artist that has ever existed, which is Charles Knight, started creating his reconstructions. You know, Charles yeah. Knight is created all those famous prototypical dinosaurs that were then the, the prototype for all the brontosaurs that appear in movies in the later 19, like for example, Lost World, that movie, Lost World, has yep. a famous brontosaurus that is definitely based on Charles Knight's brontosaurus. And he has also, he created all these amazing uh, and iconic images, like uh, you guys seen the, the two uh, fighting dinosaurs that are like one on top of each other. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Like they're kind of greenish and one's jumping and the other one, kind of like a cat exactly. on its back with its mm-hmm. exactly. feet in the air. Which yep. also is cool because it was, I think it's one of the first depiction of dinosaurs as, as active animals in more of an acting pose than what we saw before that. He is definitely perhaps the most important paleo artist that has ever existed because he really changed things. And he was, of course, fueled by all these new discoveries that were happening in the United States at that moment. I mean, it, it was the center of paleontology. That's where the big uh, iconic species were being found in the, in the western side of the United States. Charles R. Knight is a fascinating character. And just like modern day paleo artists, he was hanging out with paleontologists. He had a lot, he was he was closely associated with Henry Fairfield Osborne and Edward Cope, and he was an incredible animal illustrator. I have a book that he wrote, which is his guidelines to animal illustration. Oh, that's cool. And he, I read an, a biography of him at one point, and he would go to zoos and look at modern animals, and then use that to translate to these extinct creature reconstructions. He was. Like that, it, the the image of a paleo artist entrenched in both the field of animal anatomy and paleontology. Yeah, and I think like the late 1800s and the beginning, the first three decades of the 1900s were completely influenced by his work. You know, every dinosaur that you saw in any depiction at the moment looked like one of his dinosaurs. Like the dinosaurs in the movie Lost World, the dinosaurs. In, the, in King Kong that you guys talked about in one of your recent episodes, they yeah. were completely Charles Knight inspired. Yeah. yeah, It's like how nowadays, ever since the mid-90s, all the dinosaurs in movies have been very much Jurassic Park-style dinosaurs. Where even the roar and the noises they make are matching. Yep. Yeah. Charles R. Knight was the first trendsetter, I guess, in a big way. Oh, it's yeah. kind of the, um, the paleo-art renaissance of bringing realism and bringing, you know, more natural depictions and stuff into it. Well, uh, is that, really... is actually, that is actually a term. The, oh, cool. The, our Renaissance, it happens in the 70s, though. It happens in the 1970s, so not later. But, but yeah, that, that's actually a part when we start seeing dinosaurs. As an, that's when we start seeing, well, I'm not going to, first let me talk to you about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, um, I jumped ahead. <laughs> so, like, Decades later, there's another very important person in paleo art, which is in 1940, uh, Salinger, the famous Rudolf Salinger, created his famous, and this is very important for me because that famous mural of the age of reptiles that is in, um, in the Yale Peabody Museum is more than 30 meters long, and it goes from, uh, you can see a depiction of the f- fauna, because not only dinosaurs, there are several animals there, and flora from the Cretaceous to the Permian period. So you go Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, and Permian. And it's, I mean, that Tyrannosaur, the Tyrannosaurus that he did there, is one that he painted there, is one of the most iconic Tyrannosaurus in the history of paleo art. I think everybody remembers. Now, of course, by today's standards, it's quite inaccurate. 
but it's still, I mean, that is the way that he did as an artist, the way that he painted that mural and those trees, every leaf uh, is just amazingly done. And I've been to the Peabody and I've seen that mural in person and it's just an impressive, it's the same feeling as when you stand in front of the fully mounted skeletons themselves. Mm -hmm. It's just an impressive thing that a person did. Like, it's an incredible piece of work. It's so cool. Listeners, go to Yale. Go to the Peabody Museum. Yes. It's it's really something. Hey, David, I know what our next trip should be. All right, well, <laughs> we got we'll head up to Yale. <laughs> and and it also ties to one of your episodes, because I was as I was telling you before we started recording the show, that Tyrannosaur from Salinger is what inspired the concept for Godzilla for the in the first Godzilla movie uh, that you guys had also a recent episode about. They were inspired by definitely that Tyrannosaurus. You know, it has the same now outdated, very erect posture. It was very, uh, it was one of those key moments in the history of paleo art where it's a very influential moment. Oh, that's very cool. I mean, having inspired Godzilla it's a is pretty influential. That's a pretty big deal. That's a notable feather in the cap. Yeah. That's awesome. And so then afterwards, we talk about what you were saying about the uh, about the like uh, the renaissance of, of paleo art, of, of the reformation, which is in the 1970s, which is when Gregory Paul starts reconstructing his dinosaurs in a much more active, much more bird-like even though they were featherless for the most part at that point, um, he reconstructed them as active animals, you know, running and not just as lumbering beasts <laughs> that were always on a swamp, because that's how they were usually depicted before, as just, you know, these slow lumbering beasts that were too stupid and that's probably why they got extinct you know, <laughs> yes. in the first place. So, yeah, in the 1970s is when Gregory Paul starts creating this very active, very skinny by today's standards, also very skinny dinosaurs. But it was a, it, it created a, another key point in the history of paleo. There wouldn't there wouldn't have been any Jurassic Park dinosaurs if it if it hadn't been for Paul's depiction of them as active animals. You have to remember that when Jurassic Park, I think even Jurassic Park, the first movie makes a point of saying, you know, these were very active. That was our first. Uh, that was the first time I think the general audience saw dinosaurs as active, smart creatures. There's even a point at the beginning when they see the brachiosaur and L, uh, uh, Dr. Sattler says, this thing didn't live in a swamp. Yep. Actively countering those old uh, tropes in the depictions of dinosaurs. That is my favorite scene from that movie, by the way. Yeah, the, by the way, they, they got out of the car and they see the, the, walk, the brachiosaurus walking that is, I mean, everybody wants to do that at some point. They wanted to do that at some point in their life, you know. Yes. To see a dinosaur like so big and so majestic in front of you, walking like that is amazing. It would have been amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, and then after that, after Jurassic Park came out in the 90s, you know, I think that we are now at a different point in paleo art right now. First of all, I think there are more paleo artists today than ever before. Mm -hmm. Um and also, we are living in the golden age of dinosaur discoveries. More dinosaurs now are being discovered than ever before. More, we, we're finding out more about the way they look than we ever thought possible. I mean, uh, you guys have talked about this before, but you know, like now we know what some species could have been possibly colored, and how they could have, you know, what the what the coloration they could have had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know a lot more about the way they look like and what how many of them have, many and probably m most of them have uh, feathers or feather-like integument. So yeah, now we know a lot more. And so there's a lot more paleo artists working. And also there is a lot more, like everything else nowadays, there's a lot more change. It's a lot, it's, the change is, is much faster in the paleo art at this point. Yeah, they're, they're able to update it you know, very quickly as new research comes out. It's, it's I've always ha had a lot of fun watching that as a new article will come out and then you'll see a few new pieces of art for that dinosaur incorporating 
that information or yeah. or updating a posture or something which is that's yes. very cool to watch that process in real time yes. it also means that art is becoming outdated more quickly yes oh, never yes. before <laughs> but 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 it's like anything in science also i mean how there as somebody that worked before also with taxonomy i know how quickly taxonomy can become outdated <laughs> in a matter of you know <laughs> just a year like you know it's changed it switched genera like five times. A frog is switched genera like five times. So, you know, it, it's not unlike other branches of, of science. So as a paleo, before we move on to our next major topic, I just want to ask, because you mentioned the new dinosaur discoveries, as an artist, how exciting is it to see a study come out that can tell you the color or skin texture of a dinosaur? extremely that is one of the coolest things because for the first time you can really say wow i i have an idea now where i have to put bands of what color more or less you know i can put in this area like for example i was um doing some illustrations for a, uh, an article in a bbc focus magazine that is going to appear soon i think and it's all about the coloration in dinosaurs you know i I was in charge of reconstructing some of the species that are, they're going to show. And it's just amazing that we know from so many species of dinosaurs now exactly what they look like. I mean, not exactly. I shouldn't say that. Like, we have a much better idea. Like, for example, in Chiornis, we have hundreds of fossils, very nicely preserved, where we see the color pattern in such a way that we know exactly that the tip of the feathers and the wing were black, but the rest were white. You know, it's it's so the detail that the, the amount of details that we have, and you know, I'm sure as these techniques become more refined, uh, we're gonna know a lot more. You know, so stay tuned because we're probably gonna know a lot more, even about the species that we have an idea what they look like in coloration now. Even about them, we're probably go we're gonna go into more detail. Uh, this is the the tip of the color iceberg. Yes, for sure. So we've got a bit of history. Now let's move in to talking about modern day paleo art, what it what actually goes into the process, specifically talking about your process and your experience, Gabriel. We'll get into that just after the break. So let's talk a bit about the process of paleo art. And since we are joined by our guest paleo artist, I'll ask about your experience, Gabriel. How do you go about reconstructing an ancient organism? How do you go from whatever is left in the fossil to a fleshed out illustration or depiction? Well, it depends. It depends of, uh, of the kind of animal that you're you know, you want, you want to reconstruct. Normally, if you have the bone, I mean, if you have the fossil in front of you, that's the probably the best way to go because you can examine it in person. You can see what the what textures you have. A lot of time, uh, texture on the fossil can be very informative of the kind of integument that was covering that fossil when the animal was alive. Um, but that, it, unfortunately, at least in my experience, because I don't, I live in South Florida where there is uh, not that many <laughs> uh, Mesozoic yes. fossil sites, uh, it's not usually my experience. So you try to find as much information of the actual fossil in literature or directly from the paleontologist that is commissioning the work, the work if it is a paleontologist. Um, you want to ask as much information as you can from it. And then what I do is that I try to get as much information from related species. Sometimes um, we only have very fragmentary remains. And in that case, you have to infer a lot from related species that hopefully are more complete. So if we have like skeletons from like fossils from animals that are related but are more complete, then you can infer more or less what that animal could have looked like in parts of it when we don't have parts of its, of its uh, anatomy. And then uh, I also look at uh, phylogeny, what that animal is related to, 
and uh, that also is very informative to know what kind of uh, uh, how it could have looked or even what kind of behavior it could have had. And then I also look at the habitat. What do we know about the environment in which it lived? What plants were present? What kind of temperature? If we know, because by the time, by the way, that's not always present in the data that you know from a specimen. I mean, sometimes uh, sites have very little information. So in that case, I try to look as for the closest geographical place that has that information from the same geological period. So for example, if it's a species from the late Jurassic, I try to look for the closest place from the late Jurassic that has information about the plants, environments. In that way, you make the best educated guess, I guess. Interesting. I, I feel like that could that could be a long search at some some. It is. it is, and it's a lot of reading of a lot of papers. What <laughs> I always tell people, you have to, if you want to be a paleo artist, you have to read a lot. You have to read a lot. You have to read a lot of papers and keep reading and stay on top of it and keep a lot of lit, read a lot of literature because that's basically basically what's giving you the information. So the other thing that I think is very important uh, for paleo artists is to observe extant animals. You know, to to be very to become very familiar with their morphology, both external and internal, and to to know how that animal behaved. Because even if they are not related to animals in the past, they might be occupying the same niche, and they might be, you know, some of the same. Uh, they might be behaving in a similar way, you know, due to convergent evolution that I'm sure you guys have talked about. So, yeah, so I think observing extant animals is super important. Besides, it, 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 it's, I think it's a, it's a great exercise to sketch animals directly. I mean, like going to the zoo or a park or, or the forest and, and finding an animal and sketching it directly. I think that's a great exercise for an artist. It gives you a sense of how they move and how animals move and how they behave. Because there is a tendency to depict extinct animals as movie monsters. And I'm not a huge fan of those, you know, to always depict them with like hunting or, or uh, roaring. That's a famous, that's a, that's a favorite one. Yes, so yes. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that. So um, uh, I am always trying to portray my animals doing more mundane things like sleeping or you know scratching you know, stuff like people yeah. don't normally think and but that is probably the most common behavior that you're going to see on an animal this is why when so many people go to the, the zoo or place they have it to, why isn't it moving yeah dum, dum, dum. <laughs> do something I, interesting i hate that hate yeah. it with a passion <laughs> I, my response to people, because I like at the aquarium, I would have people who'd be like, "Why isn't it? Why aren't they doing anything?" I go, "Well, I mean, if if we just popped into your apartment, would you be doing stuff at all the time?" Yeah. So, usually, I'm just sitting here at the desk. <laughs> why isn't it doing anything? <laughs> yeah, yeah, why aren't you doing anything? You sound like my boss. Yes. Yeah. I think that this discri this this discussion has brought of the very important point that. It's easy to imagine an, a paleo artist as being separate from the hard science or the more technical aspects of the science and being an artist. But to a good paleo artist, as you're describing, needs to not only be highly trained in art, artistic techniques, but you need to be able to navigate scientific literature, to understand fossils and fossilization to understand anatomy and biology of living animals. Like, this is a very technical, very scientific, very academic skill set that you need to have in order to do this. Yeah, you have to, you have to be very familiar with a lot of different subjects to be able to, to create art, paleo art that is believable. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it, it, it has to be, you have to be familiar with a lot of different subjects. But I think is that that is the case with um, a lot of scientific illustration. When you do scientific illustration of any kind, you have to be, you have to become very familiar with what you are illustrating, which is the reason why I don't do medical illustration because I'm a hypochondriac and I don't want to know anything about anything that has to do with, with diseases or anything like that. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> I've I've always been blown away when I you know really look into paleo art as to the detail in which that they are focusing on the the topic at hand for the art piece. I, I follow a, a paleo art Facebook page and I love reading the comments because every now and then sometimes it's just like oh cool painting but every now and then there's people going like well it shouldn't actually be standing in that posture because of where this tendon attaches and someone will come in and go actually because of this other muscle attaching here it balances the and i'm like i have no clue what you're talking about and i am a paleontologist <laughs> and that's amazing that's so cool it is, it is, but it can become a little bit too intense sometimes. Yes. <laughs> because um, there, there is a lot of nuance also to that. I mean, like we, like I said earlier, uh, all paleo art is essentially wrong. So what we have are hypotheses. And even when we think that that tendon could have attached there, there might have been a lot of other uh, things influencing the way that leg looked, for example. So, um, yeah, I'm always a little bit, I think some people become very rigid and forget that a lot of what we know are just hypotheses and we have to leave a little bit of room for interpretation. Uh, as a paleo artist, whether we like it or not, we, we have to use a lot of speculation in certain areas to be able to recreate these animals. It's very difficult to become so uh, fixated in some details. Uh, for sure, there are some that are make sense, and, and, and sure, you should follow and be always be you as a paleo artist, as a, any kind of artist, you should always be open to constructive and uh, respectful criticism, and that's very welcome and necessary. But a, a lot of times, uh, you know, if it is uh, certain dogmatic views, that's it can be problematic. The, for a big example of that is the discussion of lips or no lips. In that yes. Yes. That's, that's, it's a huge can of worms, and, um, and and there is good evidence for one more than the other. I'm gonna say I'm I'm, I'm pro lips, but um, but it's it's uh, it's it can be very scary to discuss that in certain groups. Yeah, divisive. Oh okay. yeah. It's uh, it's kind of one of those where you definitely want to, and this like you're saying with science in general. You, you need to be following the facts and the information, but also recognize that a lot of some facts are are harder than others and not getting stuck on every single one. Exactly. Now, when you're looking at a fossil, so you're looking for, in, you're obviously drawing from fossil evidence. Are there certain aspects of a, of a fossil that you look for or hope are preserved? Are, are there bits of fossil evidence that are most useful to you when reconstructing uh, creatures? Well, yes. If you have like an animal that has preserved integument, uh, yeah, that's always great because you have a lot more to uh, get information from. But that's very, very rare. As you know, it's you know, preserved integuments or like feather or skin is super rare. Even even though China is doing its best to to change that uh, uh, is yep. still super rare. Um, fortunately, we have a lot of fossils now with more and more uh, examples of in, in external integument. But yeah, so what you want to see is you want to try to depict an animal that is known from a fairly complete skeleton, which is also rare. And, yep. and, and you want the fossils to be, to not be taphonomically deformed, meaning that during the process of fossilization, they, the bones have all changed place and get all bent and basically look nothing like the original fossil look like, like original, original skeleton look like. So you, you want a fossil that is relatively well preserved, not too squashed, which is also rare. So basically you're asking for a lot of rare occurrences. <laughs> yes. And then with living animals, are there certain living species or living groups that you find yourself drawing from inspiration more than others? Yeah, so I, because I'm, a, I'm most attracted to reptiles, I am always in reptiles, I'm, I mean here, including birds. Because mm -hmm. yes. it's another thing that freak people out that birds are reptiles, but yeah. So I am most drawn to reptiles, for sure, and, and amphibians. 
So I, 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 am, I tend to look more at, yes, lizards, birds, snakes, crocodiles, uh, frogs, salamanders, and stuff like that, which helps a lot because um, they, in a way, many of them preserve a very basic body plan. Like, you know, the, the, the body plan of a salamander or a lizard is a basic body, body plan that many of the first, you know, land tetrapods had. And, mm -hmm. and it has appeared many, many, many times. The same happens with crocodiles, for example. The body plan of a crocodile has appeared many, many times in many, many different groups separately. They have evolved the same body plan of, a, of an aquatic, semi-aquatic or aquatic animal that has the same morphology. Yeah, it has happened in phytosaurs, has happened, which are very much crocodile-like looking. Oh my goodness, you. yes they are. Yeah, and, and it happened in a certain extent, extent uh, on the first semi-aquatic or aquatic whales. When mm -hmm. they started going into the water, they had a similar yeah. morphology. So yeah, so looking at that and understanding that that is important also for paleoarchists. Is there anything else you want to say about the paleon, the, the, the art process before we move on? Well, I, I also would like to say that, that uh, it's important, of course, the art part is super important. You have to be trained as, a, as, a, as an artist as well. You have to have a, a good understanding of, of composition and, and, uh, and traditional methods of illustration. Uh, that always is helpful and, and it's a very important part of the of the of being a paleo artist. Very cool. And now that leads nicely into my next question, which is a question that I'm sure you get. I, I would guess you get a lot because we get the equivalent question here. For any of our listeners who are wondering, how does one become a paleo artist? So I studied graphic design and illustration. So I was an illustrator. And because I was working as a herpetologist and I was involved in herpetology, in the world of herpetology, you know, I was describing species, and like I said, art is more is more intertwined with science than people think. So a lot of times, when you, for example, are publishing a new species, a new species of lizard, a snake, or crocodile, even though there no, no, not many of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once in a blue moon. <laughs> yeah, you have to depict, for example, the head of the holotype. And the holotype is the the specimen that is basically re is the representative of that species. That's what everybody's gonna measure that species from. You have to draw the head of a lizard, for example. In, when we are, we're describing a species, who was the default person between the authors that was gonna uh, draw that? It was always me, because I was usually the only one who knew how to draw between my co-authors and me. So um, I started doing that. And for example, I got a, 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 a paper where we didn't have pictures of this of the animal, of the lizard that we wanted to talk about. And I said, well, no problem. I can, I can do the illustration. I can illustrate the lizard and we can use it. And that started, you know, getting a life of its own. And I started doing more and more illustrations and I started working more and more as a scientist, scientific illustration, illustrator. And until I find myself working all the time as a scientific illustrator. And as a scientific illustrator, you're going to, find the world of paleo art, paleo art sooner or later because it's such an important uh, segment of the world of scientific illustration. And uh, because I love dinosaurs all my life, it was like a natural progression for me to become a paleo artist at some point. So I, I'm, I, I still consider myself a, a newcomer, uh, even though I've been fortunate to get a lot of uh, commissions I've been doing this for, I've been doing paleo art only for about four years, and it's been great. I mean, I've been getting a lot of work, but, but yeah, I still consider myself a, a newcomer. Do you have any advice for prospective newcomers? Well, like I said before, you have to read a lot. Uh, try to get your the subject that you're going to reconstruct the best, get familiarized with that animal and their phylogeny and what they're related to and yeah so read a lot <laughs> <laughs> always a good bit of advice in general yes, it is it is always useful now before we wrap up our discussion this whole time we have, ha have been sort of 
reaping the benefit of having Gabriel talk to us as the our paleo artist representative. But just like any fields, there are tons. Like you said, there are more paleo artists now than ever before. There are just a, just a whole horde around the world of amazing paleo artists. So for the listeners, for listeners who are interested in being introduced to new artists or following paleo artists, and we'll put a whole bunch of links in the blog post as we always do. Gabriel, who are some of uh, your favorites, the people who inspire you, people you would recommend that other people look at? Who are the paleo artists that you like? So uh, I'm, I'm going to give you guys a, a, a bunch of names, and, and you're going to have to uh, – it's going to be your job, the listeners, to go find them on social media for the ones that are active now. Um, because uh, if I start listing a lot of handle names – it's gonna, you know, and I don't remember all the handle names, so, <laughs> so uh, it's, it, you know, do a little bit of work. Um, <laughs> and we'll put the links for anyone who has uh, online websites and handles. If we mention them here, we will do our best to get the info and put it in the blog post. Okay, that's great. Um, so yeah, the, of course, like there are a lot of people that we talk in, when we're talking about the history of paleo art that have been extremely influential for me. Uh, Salinger and uh, Gregory Paul and have been, of course, as you can imagine, extremely influential for me. But I, but I want to concentrate on the people that are active now, because um, I think there are a ton of amazing paleo artists that have been extremely influential for me, uh, who I admire a lot. And um, I would have to say, like, for example, John Conway, who did uh, with um, Coleman and Darren Nash? He did that book all yesterdays, which is amazing and it's such an important <laughs> and it's, yeah, super inspirational for me. And it, it was one of the things that that um, inspired me to become a paleo artist. That book, also uh, Darren Nash and John Conway's uh, work. Um, he's an amazing yours and he's done some really amazing pieces that are just wow I mean if you're not familiar with him what are you doing you have to go search yeah. for his <laughs> for his um, social media stuff he's active he's not that active on, on social media but but he posts stuff on Twitter every now and then and you can see his website he has really amazing uh, paleo art then it's also Mark Whitten who does this super moody very British looking paleo art. Um, he has a, um, there's something I should have mentioned also is that before is that every paleo artist has like their, has to develop their own style. They, everybody has their own style, which is why I think there's room for everybody. There's room for all paleo artists because every paleo artist has like its own flavor. So in, for example, in the case of Mark Whitten, because he is uh, from um, the UK, and we all know how wonderfully sunny the UK is. Not. <laughs> <laughs> um, his pieces tend to be very moody and, and, and cloudy, and uh, you see there's a lot of atmosphere. He's a, an amazing paleo artist. Also, uh, he's super, um, he pays a lot of attention to what, to what science can tell us about how the animal look. And he actually wrote a book recently that I recommend everybody gets, which is the Paleo Artist Handbook. And uh, it's really a good uh, guide for Paleo Artists to, you know, are, are thinking about what information can a fossil give us, what certain kind of texture um, bone can have, and what information that can give us to what the skin could have looked like if it was tied to the bone or if it had more uh, tissue between it. Uh, you know how much uh, he he it's a book that like gathers all the most recent information of what we know is available about external integuments uh, and 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 the ways to recreate extinct that. So highly recommended. Mark Whitten is an amazing artist as well. Um, then is also Emily Willoughby who does these amazing reconstructions of feathered dinosaurs. 
super inspirational for me. She's an amazing artist, uh, and she does she does some of the most beautiful feathered dinosaurs. Um, then there's also uh, Martin Martin Nuke, who uh, wrote this uh, book, this field guide in a field guide style uh, about birds of the Mesozoic, and within the birds of the Mesozoic are dromaeosaurs, and uh, he he wonderfully, in a very simple art style, he can depict uh, dinosaurs in a way that looks so realistic and makes so much sense, uh, feathered dinosaurs particularly. So he, he's also a wonderful artist. Then um, we have, there are a bunch of really cool artists uh, active on Twitter. That's a great place to, to find artists. So, um, of course, there's the wonderful illustrations from uh, Julius Estoni, who's done really amazing work. And also Andre Atuchin, which I'm a huge fan of. He has a style that I really like, and he's done a ton of murals. Um, I think a lot of the, I think actually if I'm correct, the murals for the new exhibit, exhibit of the Smithsonian that is about to open are from him. For what I've heard, and if you're familiar with his work, they're gonna be amazing, so. <laughs> Really, really good artist. Then there's also uh, Jet Taylor, who does really amazing uh, dromaeosaurs. He, he does a lot of cool art, but his dromaeosaurs in particular are really uh, great. And um, I mean, there are so many artists. I could just sit here and tell you so many artists. I usually do um, follow Fridays on Twitter, where I mention like all the artists that are, inspire me at the moment. Because honestly, there are like a ton of paleo artists that are truly amazing. Um, I can give you guys a list of people that inspire me, and we can put the links on in the show notes. Absolutely, it's no, a great be- way for people to find them. Yeah, yeah. Well, this hopefully this is a good list to get people started. Because it, really, it's there's a rabbit hole, and oh, yes. if, every time I think that I've sort of learned the names of the big deal paleo artists who are important these days i i then learn about somebody else who's doing mm-hmm. incredible work because it's it's like trying to learn who all the paleontologists are yeah they're just everywhere there's well, tons just of them wait until next year and there's someone new yep. <laughs> yeah 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 and, and and you know honestly i mean there's so many people that are inspiring uh so many artists that are inspiring i find myself always sharing information with them and getting inspired by their work you know it's a it's like a symbiosis i think i hope they're getting inspired by my work as well it's like when you go to scientific conferences Mm -hmm. and everyone Mm -hmm. learns about each other's research and it just gets you excited about doing more of it i imagine that art has to work very much the same way yes yes it's exactly the same and then not to leave out uh that the paleo artist star of the moment <laughs> for our listeners who want to follow you uh where can they find you what where are you online and what sort of projects might they be on the lookout for well so um right now i'm working on a lot of stuff that i cannot really talk about because a lot of it is under embargo but i can mention a couple of projects that are well, more than a couple of projects that i'm working on at the moment first of all uh this is a big thing and i'm, I'm if you follow me on social media, you know that I have been working for the last two years on a book called, it's going to be called Journey to the Mesozoic, Volume 1. Hopefully there will be a Volume 2 if I can, if, <laughs> if, it, goes, if, it, if it does well. But um, it's Volume 1 is going to deal with the tetrapods from the Triassic and the Jurassic. So what I'm doing is that I am, it's basically, a, 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 it's going to take the, the reader through a journey through the different stages, the different geological periods. And through those geological geological periods, I'm gonna zoom in certain formations. And from each formation, geological formation, I'm gonna give you uh, uh, like a, uh, an overview of what the tetrapods that live in each formation look like and were like. So it's like, it's, it's gonna be done in a, in a, a field guide style but the depictions of each formation are going to be arranged in cladograms. So you can also see the evolutionary relationship between the species that live in each place. Oh, cool. And Very be- cool. Besides that, there's going to be like a, a section of the book that deals with 
the biggest clades of animals of tetrapods that live during those times. And in that in that in that part of the book, there are going to be more um, traditional type of illustrations. So so you're going to have like depictions of animals with backgrounds and uh, living in their environments. So at this point, I mean, it's it's a lot of work, and that book is killing me. But I hope it's 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 ready this year. I hope it's ready this year because I, I put blood, sweat, and tears into making it. And um, aside from that, I am currently working on the, the few commissions that I can that are not under embargo. Is that, for example, I'm working on a on a commission for the Australian Maritime Museum, Australian National Maritime Museum, I think it's their name. And they commissioned a bunch of marine reptiles that I'm still working on, Mesozoic marine reptiles. Uh, so I got to do like a, a Tylosaurus, which is a mosasaur, Elasmosaurus, um, a Chronosaur, uh, Chronosaurus, which is that huge Pleosaur that uh, was like gigantic, and well sized Ichthyosaurs. And stuff like that, and they're gonna be uh, arranged in a plate next to silhouettes from modern aquatic animals. So next to like a silhouette from like a blue whale and an orca and stuff yeah. like that. Oh, cool. that sounds like a ton of fun. Yeah, that's yes. really neat. It's been a lot, a lot of fun to do on that, to to be commissioned to do that. Um, and I am also, let me see, what other one I can talk about? Oh, well, I told you about the the focus. BBC Focus Science Magazine that I got to do uh, 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 several illustrations for. There actually some of the illustrations that were there were some illustrations that are going to be in my book, but I licensed some of them to be used in this article. And I, I was commissioned to do uh, one I was commissioned to do, which was the reconstruction of the Borealo Pelta, the ankylosaur that was beautifully preserved, that was found recently that was beautifully preserved and we know that it was like reddish in coloration and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on display at the Royal Tyrell. Exactly. exactly. And it's so cool. Yes. And so I got to do a reconstruction of that, which was awesome. So I, I'm working right now in several commissions for museums and stuff that I cannot talk about, but <laughs> so that's what I'm, I'm working on at the moment. You guys can find me on social media. I'm on I'm on Twitter, I'm on, I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Facebook, although Facebook I don't use that much. Everywhere you can find me at Serpent Illus, like serpent, like snake, and then Illus, like illustration. Oh, and then you have a website, which we can link to in the blog post. I have a website, which is GabrielUgetto.com, and I also have a podcast that we talked yep. about earlier with my friends, uh, Ethan Kozak and Mark Schertz, where we talk about herpetology and everything herpetology related. Uh, we talk about latest news, and it's a lot more disorganized than than the Common Descent podcast, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot longer. So we talk forever. Yeah. <laughs> and then that is our, our official podcast shout out: is go listen to Squamates. Very cool official friends of the Common Descent podcast. <laughs> a great place to learn about. Well, because and I listen to it's always it's always fun to see what other podcasters are doing. Because I remember when you guys did the Toxic Hoffera episode, I saw that on this I have to listen to because I'm not up to date on this <laughs> the whole the Venom phylogeny and I am excited. So yes, go check out Squamates. We'll put links to all of Gabriel's stuff and all the other paleo artists that you mentioned in the blog post links to Gabriel stuff in the episode description as well. And then the extended version in the blog post, Gabriel, this has been a ton of fun having you with us. A blast. Likewise. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. This is one of those episodes that we really just could not have done justice to without someone with the actual experience of a paleo artist. So we're really happy to get you to join us. Absolutely. It was a lot of fun to be with you guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Listeners, go check out Gabriel where you can find him. Check out these other paleo artists. If you have other questions, if you have comments, follow-ups for us, find us in the usual places. If you have more detailed questions about paleo art, now you know not to ask us and ask this guy. Yes. So find Gabriel on social media and such, 
and uh, get even more wonderful information. Other than that, we release new episodes every fortnight. Find us in all the usual places. Listen to the outro for ways you can get in touch with us. Thanks again to our requesters for this topic. We've been wanting to do this one for a while. Thanks again to our patrons. If you haven't, check out our Kaijun series, which Gabriel also mentioned. Uh, Godzilla and King Kong and all those things inspired by paleo art. It's all tying together very nicely. (laughs) One last time, huge thanks again to you, Gabriel, for joining us. Yes, thank you. This was awesome. And I think that's it. Yeah. So if you'd like to join us for the traditional rambling into the (laughs) outro music. For sure. Goodbye, everybody, for now. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.